Hello, friends. Hello, everyone. Hola, buenas tardes. Hello, good afternoon. I hope that you can start taking your seat so that we can plan to get started. Don't stay too much on, on the back of the room. Thank you, thank you. There is more space here also. So. Well, hello, once again. Hola, buenas tardes. Welcome to the Ford Foundation. I am Monica Aleman Cunningham, and I am the international director for our work on gender justice here at the Ford Foundation. We are really honored to have you here, um, especially because this is the first in-person meeting of the Action Coalition on Technology Innovation for Gender Equality. So this is an opportunity for the Generation Equality family to come together. How are we doing? Any noise? Hello, hello. Please wake up some, some, some excitement in the room. This you know, we are building a feminist future. Please remember that and carry that spirit with you. You know, so we are thrilled to host this event. And I am even more thrilled to welcome Dr. Sima. This is, this is of course, my first time welcoming you. So I also take this opportunity to to let you know that the Ford Foundation is behind you and really hoping for the best as you as you execute this mandate. And with that, I want to invite you to give the opening remarks. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much to the Ford Foundation for giving us this beautiful space to have our meeting, but also for leading us also on generation equality and for continuing to inspire us on how best we can work together uh, towards gender equality and women's empowerment and to the fulfillment of generation equality's objectives. So thank you. And I am so happy to see you all, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I also, not only am happy, but I would like to welcome you warmly to this event today. It is an honor to be here, actually, where we have an inspiring lineup of leaders to launch a groundbreaking year of action on the intersection of gender and technological change. Today's shifting power dynamics and the interconnected crises of conflict, COVID, and climate are pushing progress towards gender equality off track and very much off track. New forms of assaults on women's rights and democracy now threaten to roll back decades of progress that we have all worked on together. The most vulnerable populations are too often left behind. We can see this profile 
all too clearly in the form of the digital divide. This has become the new face of gender inequality. New technologies are proliferating and amplify and perpetuate existing inequalities and stereotypes. The digital divide is also preventing millions of women from accessing education, jobs, and other indispensable services. The UN Secretary General alerted us in his Common Agenda report, and I quote, we are at an inflection point in history, end of quote. Now is the time, therefore, to break the cycle of inequality and join forces to build an open, safe, and equal digital future for the generations to come. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the coming months are going to be instrumental in shaping a more inclusive digital transformation. It is time to ensure that the future of innovation contributes to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals with SDG 5 at the core. There is no more timely agenda today than of gender equality and digital technology. That is why in March 2023, the priority theme of the Commission on the Status of Women is innovation and technological change and education in the digital age for achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. This provides us a unique opportunity to holistically examine the theme of innovation and technology from a gender perspective. CSW 67 will be followed by the negotiation of a global digital compact to develop shared principles. This will help connect all people to the internet, apply human rights principles to online spaces and regulate emerging technologies. Excellencies, we will continue to work with governments across the world to shape the global normative framework and then use the agreed conclusions of CSW 67 to inform programs and partnerships alike. These preparations will require dialogue and strategic alliances among governments, UN agencies, private sector, and civil society to deliver an ambitious vision and set recommendations. Multi-stakeholder partnerships will have a key role in leading these processes to success. Since its creation two years ago, the Generation Equality Action Coalition on Technology and Innovation for Gender Equality has been instrumental in shaping global standards on gender and digital technologies, a field that has been too often overlooked. The Action Coalition brings together ideas and institutions and has experimented with new systems of cooperation. Your presence today each and every one of you contributes to expanding this global community of partners who care deeply about generating bold commitments on gender equality and technology centered on the most deeply impacted communities. More than ever, we need to stand together to affirm and to reaffirm that digital rights are women's rights. We need to reaffirm that technology should always be designed to be safe, inclusive, and accessible right from the start. We need to reaffirm that online spaces should be free of abuse and that we must improve accountability to fight harassment, discrimination, and misleading content. Our best and latest data estimate that the COVID-19 pandemic, along with the impact of other crises, has unfortunately further increased the time when the global gender gap will be closed. It has further increased it by a full generation. As a result, the distance remaining to achieve SDG 5 is even greater and time is short. Actually, time is very short. Today, we are launching this year of action on gender and technological change to mobilize all innovation ecosystems to accelerate progress and make digitalization, a tool to achieve gender equality, social justice, and poverty eradication. Let us work together to ensure that everyone, everyone, irrespective of their gender, country of origin, or economic background, has an equal opportunity to safely and meaningfully access, use, lead, and design technologies. 
This is the vision of generation equality. This will be the bedrock of our joint accountability to deliver for women and girls in all their diversity all over the world. We count on each and every one of you to place gender equality at the heart of your work. The power to design a more equal and technology-driven future is in your hands. I thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. It was really um, uh, inspiring words. Now I'm going to call our um, Deputy Executive Director, Mrs. Anita Batia, who has uh, agreed to lead the conversation today. And we're extremely thankful and proud to have her with us. And the first panel, um, Mrs. Ipek Kiraj from Coach Holding and uh, Brian Darrell from uh, Logitech. And I want to welcome the Minister from Finland, who's just joining us and has been going through an amazing traffic to be there. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Perfect timing. <laughs> Anita Brekalipek, please. The Can I invite my fellow panelists to please join me? Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome. My name is Anita Vahatia and I'm the Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. And I am delighted to be here to moderate two panels this afternoon. And let me start by joining my Executive Director, Dr. Seema Bahus, in thanking the Ford Foundation for its leadership in the Action Coalition and for giving us this beautiful space for a discussion today. So can we hear it for the Ford Foundation, please? We're going to start uh, this afternoon's panel with um, our two panelists who are representatives of what is possible when the private sector makes commitments. And Monica, thank you for those inspiring words and for reminding us that we're here to build a feminist future. So I'm going to ask very pointed, difficult questions. So please be ready on how you are helping build a feminist future. And I'm going to start with you, Ipek. Um, you are here representing Koch Holdings, uh, a hundred year old family owned company with diverse holdings in many different sectors. So tell us a little bit about Koch Holdings and what it does for gender equality. And then I'm going to ask you about your commitments. But first, tell us about Koch. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Ms. Dahouse. And thank you so much, Ms. Fatia. It's an honor to be here and I'm very excited. It's my first UN event. So. It's part of my excitement. Um, we're, we're excited to have you. <laughs> Coach Holding is a family business that is a century old, created by my grandfather. We have over 100,000 employees, and we're mainly in the male-dominated sectors, such as automotive, energy, banking. So there's a lot of um, topics there. We export to 150 countries. And our, we have 7% of all of our research and development is about the same as what Turkey spends. So it's, we spend a lot of time and energy in trying to use our motivation for research and development. For us, um, achieving gender equality is our priority and that's why we're here. And we have made commitments and I'm here to talk about our commitments and we are very dedicated in our commitments and the private sector has a lot of different responsibilities and we have to fulfill them. We are employers, we are investors, we are creators of products and services. So that gives us a lot of different impacts that we can have on. For example, we can have an impact on employee rates and pay gaps and financing ideas. So we have to use this impact and you know, we have to use this responsibility and create the equal genders that we're looking for. So what we did when we started was we first looked at our own house. We found out that about 15% of our um, employees were women. So we committed to double that to go to 30%. 
And we also started programs that provide financial support to women innovators. And one of them that we're really proud of and we'll explain is Boost. That's we do with the UNDP has worked with Koch University. And it's also train, we give trainings on leadership, business development. So the whole point of what we're trying to do is create environments where we're going to support the women and girls that are, you know, in the technology and innovation field and all fields, but especially in the technology innovation field. So we're really looking forward to next year as well, since it's the big year. And we're also transforming innovation and research and development process for our new products and services. So with all of these elements, we have the option to change the way we do business. And that's what we're really looking into. And we're doing a transformative and innovative guide on what we're doing. And hopefully at the end of this journey, we're going to publish it. So these are basically the three main aspects of what we're doing. That's pretty amazing because your company is so big and you operate in so many countries that something that you do actually has an influence, of course, in your company, but also in your marketplace and inspires others to follow. So thank you so much for detailing those commitments. And with that, I'd like to come to you, Bracken. You're the CEO of Logitech. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, why do you care as the CEO of this company about gender equality? Your primary goal, like most business, is to make the most money for and the most profit for your shareholders. But today's form of capitalism is no longer just shareholder capitalism, it's also stakeholder capitalism. So how do you think about that? Yeah, I, uh, well, first of all, Logitech, a little, few people probably don't know Logitech well. You might have a mouse or a keyboard, you probably don't know us too well. We, uh, I've been, and I've been in this role almost 10 years or well, nine years. I've been in the company 10 years. I've got my colleagues who are in the audience who are really leading much of our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And, um, you know, really I, I'll go back to the, the starting point for where we got here. And then I'll try to answer your question very specifically. Um, when, when I arrived in the company, uh, we had two, I had two women on my leadership team. We had a very, uh, of a leadership team, about 13, um, or 14, and we had in the company, we had, you know, very, very few, uh, I don't know, he too would probably know the number off the top of his head, but 10 years ago, our number of women suppliers was extremely small. We had no products that we really made that were really dedicated to women, even though women's hand sizes are smaller. So a mouse is not on average. So the mouse is not necessarily the right size for everyone. So we have had a lot of work to do. And, uh, and I would say, you know, the, the, the key question, you know, why in the world would we would we prioritize this over so many other things that we could do in the company? Because it touches every aspect of our company, the quality of the people, quality of the leadership team, our customer base, our supply base. You know, there's just uh, no way to overstate uh, how important uh, being balanced and being really, you know, gender fair across everything is to our company. And I think as, as time rolled on and the years have stacked up, uh, in my tenure at Logitech, and as I've you know had people like Prakash who's in the audience and David Ladin and E2 join me, you know I think it became clearer and clearer that we just weren't moving fast enough, and we're still probably not moving fast enough. Uh, so we really tried to elevate our game, and and um, you know the the business case for diversity in general is not hard to make. The moral case for diversity is obvious, and it's just inexcusable if companies haven't prioritized it. Not only because it's the because of stakeholder capitalism, because of capitalism, you know, you, you just can't win if you're not winning uh, the the gender game, and at least I believe that's the future. So I think you know, every company that I, every company in the world needs to view it as imperative, and we certainly do. Thank you very much. So you know, it's it's really great to hear that both companies, even though they're quite different in what they do, the markets recognize this, the fundamentals of gender equality. But the, the name of this panel is Walking the Talk. So when you try to do this, it's not easy, I'm sure. You look at companies, they recruit a lot of women, but then there is some funneling. You may have 50% recruitments of women. By the time you get to the leadership team, those women have dropped off along the way because they have care burdens or other responsibilities. So 
that's just one of the challenges that we see a lot in our private sector partners. But tell us a little bit about what were the issues you faced? How difficult was it to do this? And what are your, some of your ongoing challenges? Well, I think one of the positives for us is we're very lucky because we have a large ecosystem. We have our employers, we have our distributors, we have our supply chain. So because it's a big environment, we have a big community and a big family. And that means we can have a big impact and um, for change. So what we tried to do was we started with targets and we made commitments. Eight of our biggest companies have made targets and we're following up on those very closely. We've implemented programs at primary and high school levels. We have create, we've committed to 30 programs that will reach 500,000 girls to educate them, train them, mentorship. So. I think it's a lot of, as you said, the women drop out, but for us, every position is handpicked. So we're really trying to not just talk the walk, but when you're walking it, walk it with, you know, in certain terms. So we have to, for us, one of the biggest and most important things is that we work together and we realize our potential and that's just the way that we can move forward. Because if we don't support women, we can see that the future is not going to work out. So as soon as we realize that and start working, I think that's, and change is never easy. Of course, it's going to take time. And in different countries, different cultures, it's, you know, it has a different meaning for everyone. But as long as we're persistent, I think we will, if that's the key for being persistent, this is just the beginning of the journey. And, you know, we first said we will go up to 30%. Hopefully then we'll say 50%. So it's just something that we can't give up on. And I think that's how we're going to tackle most of our, you know, problems with this journey. Yeah. So persistence is key. Bracken, move into you. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the issues you face, how you must run into some challenges and in, in whether it's finding the women, keeping, retaining talent, the pay gap, what are some of the issues you face? Yeah, there, 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 there's so many issues that we've, that we, we've bumped into and keep running into. And I'll give you a few examples, you know, so the pay gap, you know, the pay gap, here's the problem with the pay, the way pay gap generally works. Most companies are, are, are given, put, we have pressure on us to make sure that we're paying fairly, you know, gender fair. And so we hire our law firms to then do the audits. The problem is our law firms uh, work for us. So they want us to look good. <laughs> and there are a lot of ways to look at data. Yes. You know, and if you move one group into another group, if you classify them differently, you can usually get to an answer that looks pretty good. Yes. And I think most companies like us looked really good when we hired our law firms to tell us that we were right. And, uh, and we usually were. And then, uh, Finally, a start. There's one startup called Cindio, which I'd encourage anybody in the audience who's heard of them to, or who hasn't heard of them, to look them up. You know, they do a very database, real time, all the time measurement of where you are on on gender fairness. And you know, we had them go through and evaluate it. Now we use them as a routine. And guess what? We had some gaps, <laughs> so we've had to close them. Uh, that's one example. Second one, uh, you know, it's it's probably startling to you. it's maybe it's not startling to you. It is startling to me. That, that software engineering was about 35% women in 1995. Mm -hmm. And today it's about 24%. So it's gone down. That's and, shocking. And only 10% of, of those women who are graduating are working as software engineers or in software engineering management. So there's a real problem out there. Now here's the, here's the fall on effect. When my, when, uh, you know, when I would go to somebody on my team or, or, or Prakash would go to somebody on his team and say, hey, you know, are we really getting what I want to see who we're hiring the answer was, well, you know, we're not hiring very many women, but that's because only 24% are graduating from universities. And, you know, that sounds pretty good until you think about it. Then you think, well, let's see, we're going to hire 100 engineers this year. And there are a million engineers in the world who are, who are coming out of schools who are women. And we can't find 100 out of a million. That's a pretty small number. Yeah. So we've got, you know, the, the, the biases that are built into to the whole system are, are pretty bad. And I'll give you one more. You know, we, we, we would hire a recruiter and, you know, or we would hire somebody who would come in and take over a job. And it's amazing how often uh, they would source from their networks. And if it's a, if it's a man, the network tends to be more male. And on average, it was more men. 
and it just perpetuates itself. If we hired a recruiter, the recruiter would go into their, their database. Their database tended to be almost all men. Guess what? They'd give us a slate of all men. And so we, one of the things we did, we said, okay, from now on, every recruiter, every job, if you don't show us, if you don't have women on the slate, you're fired. You know, it's amazing how fast the women showed up in their face. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable, you know, and I'm, the, I'm a very nice guy normally, but it's just incredible to me that, <laughs> that it was that easy. And it is that easy sometimes. Sometimes it's not so easy. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And um, I do want to uh, close out this panel, but I do, before we do that, ask you about something that's a little difficult, which is the whole issue of attitudes, stereotypes, and prejudices, because a lot of gender inequality happens because we, and sometimes women have that too, have certain images of what men can do and what women can do. So this issue of unconscious bias is really important. And in the tech industry, which is considered, at least in the US, a bro industry, uh, I'm really curious about how do you tackle this issue of unconscious bias? And what can you tell us about it that inspires others in this audience to join the fight for gender equality? Well, I think first you, you need to be aware of it in yourself. You know, I, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I grew up, uh, there are unconscious biases of all kinds. You know, I, I thought I was a really good guy in general. Until <laughs> I really did. I mean, I can give you all the reasons why I was sure I was a really good guy and far on the far good side of, of any topic like this one until the George Floyd murder. And uh -huh. then I realized I hadn't said a word publicly uh, about, about racism and about, about anything that really, that mattered that, you know, that mattered so much in the, in the area of, of racism. And, and so I really flipped the script on my whole life. And I think, you know, it starts with being self-aware and it's amazing how, how self-aware we are not mm -hmm. uh, because of all the biases that we, we naturally have grown up with. You know, I think um, I want to, I want to pivot that question a little bit and say, what's the, now, now if you flip from your, yourself and your own biases, how do we flip the script and have the biggest impact we possibly can? Now, this is, a, this is for all, anybody who's in a company out there. Here's the big answer. Uh, gender fair. If we, if we set standards for ourselves, start measuring them like Koch Group is, start measuring exactly how we're doing and what kind of progress are we making, set standards up and down the organization from top to bottom on the leadership team, the board, have you know, the chair, the, the, what's the board look like, what's the leadership team look like, all the way to every, every job in the company. We start measuring all that. We set standards. The single biggest impact any company of any size can have is on their suppliers. Hmm. So gender fair is a program we've now got. I mean, there's a trillion dollars worth of buying power out there. If we start setting some, if we, if more and more companies join this effort and we say, we're going to have certain standards, we're going to evaluate our suppliers based on those standards. And kind of like that recruiter, you're either in or you're out, you know, make, make the, make the, make the consequences tougher and tougher. We can move the whole world. And I really think so. So I'm really excited about the concept of gender fairness. It helps. Uh, it'll help move those biases that are internal to all of us out of the way as we use numbers to make sure that we're really making a difference. No, thank you so much. That's really inspiring. And I think having a role model like you as the CEO and having the CEO drive this change really makes a difference. And I know in our audience, we are very privileged today to have with us the minister from Rwanda, the minister from Finland, the UN Secretary General's envoy on um, uh, digital technology. And I know that they're going to take these examples back and say, hey, we just were in this event and we heard about the CEO who's using data and maybe you guys can do this too. So thank you so much for Bracken thank you. for being with us. I know you were supposed to be in Berlin, but you made a conscious choice to be uh, with us. I was in Berlin this morning. <laughs> oh, well, ah, even better. So but thank I, you so much. If I could just take a second and thank yes, my please. team back here. I've already mentioned them. So Who is this famous there. Prakash? <laughs> He should be famous. He will be one day. <laughs> so should David and E2. And, okay, uh, thank you. Let's hear it for the he for she champions back there. In fact, thank you so much for being with us today. Tell us how you're dealing with unconscious bias. Well, I think how we're dealing it with it is the first step for us is we have to recognize the fact that we don't have to do everything alone. We can come together as with companies, with governments, with institutions, because the effect of collective action is so higher than trying to tackle everything alone that that for us is 
very inspiring so that we can actually inspire each other. Mm -hmm. And one of the other ways for us, and that's really important, is we have to be transparent and we have to be accountable. So because we're giving all these promises and then, you know, we have to follow up on them. So that's the data. That's the data. So everything has to be data driven because otherwise we're just talking the walk and we're not walking it. So for us, I think being together and working together because this is not a race. This is unity. We are racing against time always because, you know, we never have enough. But I think as long as we come together, we will face all of these biases and all of it much easier and that's what we're seeing thank you so much both of you for being with us today for inspiring the audience and for giving us real food for thought on how we can create those multi-stakeholder coalitions which is what of course the action coalition epitomizes thank you again big thank hand so to much. our panelists now uh Can you hear me? Yes. I'd like to invite our second panel to join me on the stage, please. Your Excellency, the Minister from Rwanda, Your Excellency, the Minister from Finland, and the SG Special Envoy. And I am going to move back just a little bit. Amandi, please, Minister. I am delighted to now shift to another part of the Action Coalition, which is our public sector partners, and delighted to be joined by Her Excellency Paola Ingeberi, the Minister of ICT and Innovation from Rwanda, uh, His Excellency Mr. Vili Skinari, the Minister for Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland, and Mr. Avandeep Sengil, the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Technology. Welcome. Welcome. Warm welcome to all of them. Please join me in welcoming them. We've just heard from two representatives from the private sector on what they are doing to move the needle on gender equality in a very male dominated field. We just heard these shocking numbers of there has been an actual huge reduction in the number of women who are studying software engineering. We're not very far away from 2030 and the achievement of the SDGs. SDG 5 is supremely challenged. So from your perspective, and I'll start with you, Minister Skinari, Finland is a major commitment maker and the first one to lead this action coalition. Please tell us from your perspective why this issue of gender equality and technology matters so much to you. Well, thank you for having having us here. First, I want to thank you as, as far as business and corporate people, and thank you for your family. We met in Istanbul with your family, and I really appreciated that commitment, and, and I think we have a great future together as far as gender work and everything. And thank you for coming from Berlin and telling us that how committed you are and how you're paving the way as far as business. But I, I think uh, being a Finnish minister, of course, I'm very proud to say that we have a five-party coalition government. Each and every party is led by a woman, which All is right. something. So um, it tells something that it's, it's a gender thing, but it's also a generation thing. I'm the oldest, oldest member of the Social Democrat Party. <laughs> management and Mrs. Sanna Marin is a little bit younger and she's the prime minister, the chair. But having said this, um, it's obvious that we have huge challenges. Um, and that's why for Finland, it's been self-obvious that we want to be committed to you and women. We, we are and we will be one of the largest, if the largest donators. And we really see how important it is to understand the role of the UN. And we really appreciate that Tech Envoy is here today because we even spoke yesterday, long talk, that what is the role of the UN as far as gender, but what is the role of digitalization and data, as you just spoke. And then, of course, my colleague from Rwanda, great bilateral relation, but also great work that how we improve the, uh, let's say, the digital 
penetration as far as mobile energy, everything, but how we do it gender wise and with the gender women and girl focus. The special focus for Finland now is the um, gender based online violence. We see that there are huge challenges, but there are also opportunities to tackle and solve these problems. Of course, we as legislators, politicians, we have a leading role, but then we come to the whole society and the company side, the regulation, self-regulation, but of course, the education side. And I'm, I'm proud to say that altogether, we invest some 150 million euros to these sectors together, and our investors are also, also there. So it's a long, long march, but we started more than 100 years ago, and it pays back. And therefore, I really encourage all my colleagues, whether you come from the US, Europe, Africa, any parts of the world, Middle East, to join the board. And, and the role of you and women is, is very crucial. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister Skinari. Your, and your excellency's support for uh, you and women is something that I know you discussed with our director when she was in Helsinki. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for uh, reminding us that this is a long journey. We don't have 100 years. Finland was lucky to have started 100 years ago, but those of us from the global south know that we are in a bit of a hurry and we do not have 100 years because that means we won't see gender equality, not in our lifetimes, not in our daughter's lifetimes and not in our granddaughter's lifetimes. So Minister Ingeberg. Rwanda has been at the leading edge of digitalization on the continent. Um, please share with us, what are you doing that works and what are your commitments on this link between gender and technology and how are you using gen uh, technology as an accelerator for gender equality? Thank you very much, Anita, and, and thanks to the UN Women family and uh, Sima for inviting me to be here today. Let me start by underscoring that yes, we don't have time. In fact, I think a lot of the things that we're discussing here today are things that we needed to have done yesterday. Um, but also there, there is hope. There is hope because when we think about digital transformation and digital technologies, we know that if deployed well, there's an opportunity to leapfrog and have accelerated uh, results that we're looking for. And I think this is the role that technology and innovation can really uh, play uh, if we're being intentional about it to really, uh, you know, uh, achieve uh, gender equality. And, and perhaps uh, just to share, uh, for many of you that know about Rwanda, you will know that even way before uh, we talk about technology and innovation, uh, you know, gender empowerment was, was a key pillar of what our social economic development journey was going to look like. And we started off, uh, obviously, you know, coming out of the genocide against the Tutsi, realizing that more than 50% of our population is women, and we're talking about inclusion being at the heart of our agenda, how do you become inclu included when you're not including the same people that make up more than half your population? It's really almost saying, uh, it's also as urgent today when you talk about youth, Africa has the majority of our population are youth. So if you don't have youth focused policies, then who are you creating all these things for? So it's from that same perspective that we were thinking about gender empowerment. And for us, it was that bold decision uh, to say, we're not only going to talk about uh, you know, gender responsive policies, we're also going to make a decision to say in every government level, we must have 30% of women leadership in position in, in all the different leadership positions. Today, our cabinet has over 51% of women uh, represented within the cabinet. When it goes to parliament, it's even more interesting because it becomes 62%. Now, we're starting to see the private sector also uh, take similar strides because government has sort of led the way in doing that. But again, I think it's important that we note that it's not just waking up and appointing women in, in positions of power or leadership. It's also making the intention to groom them and train them and handhold them through the process so that they can contribute in a meaningful, in a meaningful way. And so you have gender that has been mainstreamed across all sectors of our economy, but you also have technology and innovation that has been mainstreamed as an enabler in all these sectors. And so for us, this is a perfect synergy of two uh, cross-cutting themes to say, what can we do, uh, one, for these two themes uh, to, to support each other, but also to collectively support uh, growth. And so 
uh, this brings me to the pledge that we've had as a country when it comes to technology and innovation, where for us, the pledge is that by 2026, we should have we should be able to bridge the, bridge the gender gap in the STEM fields. Uh, you did talk about, you know, how the, you know, women software developers, the numbers are going down. If we don't start as early as three, five years and, and exposing them and making sure they, there's a huge pipeline that is coming up, then definitely in the years to come, there'll always be this gap when it comes to, uh, you know, employment opportunities that they can benefit uh, from. The second thing, because obviously we're talking about access to infrastructure, but how do you access infrastructure when you don't have the right device? So we did... For, for Rwanda, we, 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 we already have a database that looks at household levels and household income. And so we, we have about four tiers. And so, and partly because we want to ensure that there's a very structured graduation mechanism that allows for each household to transition from one poverty level and making themselves better until they're out of uh, poverty. And when we did that, ma majority of these uh, households were women, female-led households. And then we transpose that with data around how many of these households own a smartphone. So you collected data. We collected on that. that data. We collected the data and, and, and the stacking reality that you still had only 10% of female-led households with a, with a smartphone. Now you remember as a government, we've delivered all these services online, everything's accessible online. So it means these people actually left behind. Yes. So we had to be very deliberate about saying, if we think about device financing, we need to start thinking about how these female-led households, how these young women and female can have access to these devices, because without that, then they will, they will not have access to opportunities, to information and to services. They'll always rely on a third party for some of these, uh, uh, these basic services. And today I could say that while our target is by 2026 to achieve 100%, we're at 54.4%, but we know that partnerships are critical and that gap we must bridge. We, we can't afford to say for the last 20 years, we've come to 54%. We need another 20 years to get to 100%. We must do it in two years. And I think it's possible because where there's a will, there's a way. The third one is around financial services. Mm -hmm. In 2020, we had only 10% of women that were digitally financially included. Wow, that's small. Digitally financially included. They have, so it, you know what, what that means. If you, yes. if you don't have access to financial services, how that's can right. you even get yourself out of poverty? How can you have lead a meaningful life? And so uh, today we're at 29%, but again, it's not a, a, a statistic to be very proud of because it's important that we ensure that every, the same way we're giving them access to devices, we're also giving them the opportunity to be financially included. And the very final one I wanted to share was around, and I think we call it uh, feminist tech-enabled innovations around mm -hmm. uh, you know, startups that are female-led, women-led. And, and why is that important? Because the pressing needs to do with women, who else is better, who else is in a better position to know how to design the right products? I think when we read online, you, 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 you think of two uh, examples of the seatbelt and SE where the way it's designed, yes, <laughs> it's designed for male more than it's designed for female. So when you have accidents and you, when we're both wearing a seatbelt, I probably am going to have more harm than you will. And this is the reality of the thing. And that's why we must ensure that even as we groom uh, engineers and, and developers, we have the right, the, 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 there's the right representation in the team that will allow to have inclusive solutions. Thank you so much, Minister Ingabir. I think it is absolutely fascinating that you made this link between access to devices, but also access to financial services, because we know that women are really good at managing money. And also, also, it is really, really important to think of what that is a lever for, because if you look at what happened in the pandemic, there were many countries where governments were able to get money to women during the pandemic because they knew their phone numbers. So in Togo, the government was able to get money into the hands of women during the pandemic because they had mobile telephony at a fairly advanced level. And in India, 200 million women got cash during the pandemic because the government has a national ID system and could reach them. So thank you so much because the governments of Finland and Rwanda are going to be key for what Dr. Bahus mentioned, which is that push from governments for CSW next year. So we are going to be counting on you to be a strong voice for the inclusion of gender-friendly language 
in CSW because, believe it or not, for those of you in the private sector here, we at UN Women spend time negotiating words like gender transformative or gender responsive because some governments don't want to hear about gender transformative. Some governments do not want us to talk, believe it or not, about diversity. And many governments do not want us to talk about sexual and reproductive rights. So that's the dystopian world we're living in, which is why you know, the leadership of countries like Finland and Rwanda is really going to matter next year, as Seema uh, uh, recommended in her opening remarks. So with that, I'd like to come to you, Dr. Gail. You are the SG's envoy on technology. There are a number of partners here from the private sector. First, can I just ask you a basic question? What does that entail? <laughs> okay, <laughs> please. Uh, thank you, Anissa. Um, I, I think one of the things one of the things that entails is making sure that our digital future is inclusive, uh, it's open, it's secure, uh, and that the digital opportunity is there for everyone. So it's democratizing the uh, the digital opportunity space, and we cannot do it uh, without uh, women. Uh, and um, yeah, the other thing I want to say is that we need to, like you said, there are some uncomfortable truths, and Paula mentioned these stark figures, and, and action starts by recognizing that. So what's invisible, what's not measured is invisible, and what's invisible cannot be addressed or solved. So what we've done and what I want to announce today is that we worked on a definition of digital inclusion. I know there are different ways to talk about digital inclusion. But I think we need to speak the same language. So this is something that we worked on with Canada, Mexico, UN Women, uh, Finland, Malawi, other partners, UNDP, partners from the private sector, from civil society. And this is obviously a moving target as our ambition rises. You know, we need to adjust it. At least uh, we are launching something that gives us a basis for a conversation that's based on data, that's based on a shared um, assessment. The other thing I want to say is that we'll work with UN Women as we move to uh, the CSW, where tech and innovation is a big theme, uh, to think together and act together on how we can address the gender gap in digital, within the digital divide. This is a major issue. There is the rural urban gap. There is the, the gender gap as well. Uh, the education um, uh, uh, issue why aren't we getting, I mean, in some countries, there are more women studying computer science than men, but it's, I think in, we have a problem in, uh, in the more advanced countries. And the problem actually goes down to how we bring this into schools. And there's research today that if you talk about data and digital uh, in the languages classroom, it's, there's better uptake than when you talk about it in a maths classroom, because you know you why bring, is that? You know you bring some invisible, unconscious biases there. You know who's mediating those biases? I don't know, but we need to be more creative about how we get women and girls into computer science. And computer science is not all maths. The world of data and AI is going to be about transdisciplinarity. How we put different disciplines together. And women are great at collaboration. Uh, men often don't do uh, that well. So that's the other thought I want to leave with you. We need to build for that inclusive future where uh, data dominates, where analytics dominates, and women will be crucial to that. We are living with the consequences of male-dominated design in tech, uh, like we've lived with the consequences of piano's design for men's hands. So if we want to have a better digital future, we better make sure that we open up in the tech companies, the design arena to more uh, women. Thank you. No, thank you very much for that, uh, that insight. And you picked up on two things. That one, the issue of con conscious bias that we discussed in the first panel, but then this issue of design and how design is really influenced by the people who are designing it, who are typically men whether it is airbags or any other kind of um, uh, you know, pianos or other things. So this issue of 
making sure that there are women who are actually creating the feminist future is not just creation through actions like this, but actual physical creation of physical assets that matter for uh, gender equality. Um, you've been in your role for a few weeks now, month, how long has it been? Two months. Two months. So very much a newcomer in that sense to this role. It would be great, I think, to just share with our audience here, how does this fit into the SG's vision on the common agenda? And how is this really going to move the needle for women and girls? Right. Very briefly, uh, the common agenda is a bit to revitalize multi multilateralism and to uh, turbocharge progress on the SDGs and a look at the world's challenges uh, through the lens of commons. We have the maritime commons. Uh, we have many other global commons. Commons require that we be good stewards of what we've been uh, given to take care of. Uh, so this is the overall vision, and there will be a summit of the future in 2024, where several tracks will come together to set the direction for the future. Uh, and uh, the digital track will be one of those, and uh, we'll be working with member states and other stakeholders to make sure that we have a compelling vision for the future in which gender should be at the heart of things. Fabulous. Bravo. Let's let's. Uh... Hear it for the launch of the digital compact. And now I'm going backwards, as you can, as you've figured out. <laughs> so now I'd like to come to you, Minister Ingabire, one more time and say, there's going to be an announcement today, a call for action from everybody who's part of this action coalition. Anything you'd like to see in those recommendations that hasn't been said? Very briefly, I think everything has been said. We need action. Okay, well, I can, we can certainly agree with that. Minister Skenari, is there something in this call to action that the action coalition leaders are putting out today saying, everybody in the coalition who's already there, you need to be doing work that is driving gender equality and others who are not yet there, join the action coalition. What would you like to see in terms of recommendations? Well, first of all, I have to apologize. I just got the message and it's been 10 minutes at the headquarters in order to take action. Okay, I love it. <laughs> and I cannot avoid that. But I think we are, as said here, when we talk about implementation, taking actions, we, we heard great examples from you earlier on. In the public sector, yes, we have tools. We have legislative tools. We have regulation to do things. And that's what we have done in Finland and Nordics in general for a long time. But it's not enough. You have to have this kind of a system level approach, which is, of course, the crucial part of democratic processes, that you get people, women and girls involved at the very local level to the very top level. It takes time, but it's doable. And at the end of the day, when I started as a minister, I remember three and a half years ago, I learned that if women and girls could access education and work life as men and boys, the world's GDP would be 25% higher. That's an amazing figure. For those who are only thought, talking about money, money and efficiency, whatever. And that's something I'm reading, repeating there, even tonight at the United Nations. But I think we do have to also understand that we have to recognize the country specifics. I think Rwanda is a great example. We have work to do. The world, world is very interest-based nowadays, but we have to navigate. We have to lead by example. We have to encourage our colleagues all over the world. And that's what we're doing as far as the multilateral system. And that's why we need people like you and women and entrepreneurs like you and families like Koch family from Turkey. We need somebody who is really paving the way. But all in all, I think that what we spoke today and what we spoke about the Global Digital Compact with you yesterday at the UN, it's something that this is good action package to be implemented. What's the role of UN, UN and what's the role of the rest, the country level, companies, NGOs? because that's the way to go. And that's why I really appreciate this opportunity to be here. Thank you and sorry, I need to leave.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you very much, Dr. Gill. We're going to close out this panel. And as we do that, before you leave, one word from you to inspire our audience. One word. I can't match Paula. You know. <laughs> Let's get to action. Action. Action <laughs> is the word. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.